Hello, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us. My name is Joshua Walton. This is James Titchener. If you mix us up, we won't mind. <laughs> so we're here today to talk about data spaces. And to do that, we need to talk a little bit about where we're from. So James and I met working at the Rockwell Group in an interdisciplinary team. And so that team does things like events, like the Academy Awards. We developed the W brand, um, including the one in Union Square, and most recently the one in Paris. We did the Imagination Playground. We've done restaurants you probably, I hope you like, Nobu, uh, Mylino, um, Winkin Film Society. We love New York. We're doing all sorts of projects in New York. Um, but I guess the question is, why are we here? So our team, um, we formed a team that's the lab. We're about 20 people now. We've been around for four or five years. And we're interested in the intersection between the physical and digital. So. We do events, we do temporary interactive installations, projections on giant spheres with interactive maracas, walk, <laughs> so clear. Um, <laughs> we did the, the uh, at T5, the JetBlue terminal at JFK, we did a huge interactive ring there. And well, we'll get more into it as we go through. It'll become clearer, I hope. So to summarize, though, we think about choreographing environments. And uh, we love the idea of how everything in the environment can come together to tell a story. This really comes from the way we think about architecture and telling stories with all of the materials in a space. But enlarging the toolkit of the materials we use to include the virtual and sort of thinking about the things from the scale of objects to the environment to how people move through the space to the meaning you want to get. And the choreography is really important to us because it's mixing the ephemeral, the, the program, the sort of software of the space, and the space itself, and all the infrastructure that allows that to happen. And we love data. <laughs> <laughs> so some questions we ask ourselves are that when you're in spaces, sort of where are you? You know, we, we definitely have all the physical places that we go, but we also have all the virtual activities we're doing. You know, even when I look around throughout the day today, you know, people checking their phones, checking their laptops, but they're also here at the conference and participating in it. So these are the kinds of problems we think about in the spaces we build. And so we, we think about, you know, with the ephemeral, it is also so much about sensing and input. This is a space where rather than creating an interactive piece, it's a reactive piece that tracks people moving under this projection. As they move under it, they cause these butterflies to scatter. Um, so rather than interactive back and forth, it's tracking the circulation through the space to create a living interactive wallpaper. And this data is recorded over time. And actually, one of the reasons we're excited to be here is to talk to all of you about what we should do with these millions of points of data that are sitting in our databases. Um, <laughs> and, so oh, okay. after you. <laughs> you know, and, and we're, we're interested in this idea of how we can, how we can feel data how we can create unique interactive platforms to experience high-res content in new and unique ways. In this case, this is a um, lobby space of a casino in Las Vegas, where these are six foot by 14 foot uh, columns that are with high-res high video columns with mirrors in front of them. So you're actually walking through this video display system. But actually, that's not really fair to call it video display. What's great about it is that it's actually both video and generative work. So here, this is these pieces are all generatively created. So you have um, all written in, in software and creating these particle systems that will grow and evolve over time. And then you have 16 sensors in the space tracking people's movements. So it's beginning to think about this entire piece as an ecosystem of what's put into it and the people moving through it. And so we actually do a lot of work with computer vision systems. And so in this installation, for instance, we use computer visions to track the peop computer visions, computer vision to track the people coming in and out of the space. And from some of this work, we released an open source toolkit called OpenTSPS, toolkit for sensing people in spaces that we use to collect this data. And in this case, what's exciting is that they can transform the content based on the activity in the space itself. So it can dynamically change based on how many people are occupying the space, how crazy they're getting, because it is Las Vegas. So if they start to get too crazy, it all becomes a little bit more relaxed. 
so they don't break anything. Or, or yeah, because of the, the, the scale of it, because the space itself is actually generated by all this content, the space itself actually changes at an instant. So you're able to reprogram this lobby space dependent upon it being the morning or an event or reacting live to how people are using it. And yeah, what, I guess just to reiterate or to talk a little bit more in depth about the um, generative part of it, it's so important. I don't know if anyone's ever been in a space with looping music, but it's a good way to go crazy. And so when we think about designing environments that people will want to be in over time, one of the critical ideas is that it should feel the same, mm. but different. You know, just like when you go back to your favorite restaurant, you want something similar, but maybe a little bit something new. So one of the things we look at by using all generative software is to keep that vibrancy. And so this is a, another space like that where here, what's exciting about this and this, this, the ring we did for JetBlue is how we could take this single platform of building all these screens and then update the software for it to make new uses for it. So it's actually able to interact with people's phones. Now it's, it has all these new use cases where it can be used for the, originally it was an art platform, but then it evolved to be able to be having people send messaging about event, um, what's happening in the terminal or new flights that, that they're trying to promote as an airline. And this is just kind of a little peek into this idea that we don't feel like spaces are really conveying enough about our digital lives yet. You know, even, even in this space, we feel a little bit of it, but you know, how much activity is happening on social networks right now related to what we're doing? You know, not, nothing's really telling us that in the space. And so that's where we see our lab doing the bulk of its research. And part of that is I've noticed at this conference in particular, people completely engrossed in their phones. And we've been thinking about how, how do you get people to do something from their phone and connect it to a larger environment? So we've been developing a lot of technologies that allow you to create shared displays. So everyone can participate on an individual mobile device, throw things to a shared canvas. The shared canvas is also a touch interface. Um, and you know, this is, was kind of a proof of concept for us about the core technology, but also about an interaction that makes social spaces more social. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. actually, the next one shows an example of that where, where we, we use this technology. We use the same technology for an event. This was at the National Building Museum in DC. They were celebrating their 25th anniversary. And it's, it's a pretty simple interface. It's, it's this huge um, fabric is hung to project onto, create this shared canvas. And then it's almost, you could very quickly build a skyline <laughs> together. And it's, it's really goofy to play with in a sense, but if enough people use it at the same time, it launches these fireworks and it becomes a shared experience. Um, and it sort of changes this, this, this stuffy sort of cocktail party fundraiser and functions in the way party favors have always functioned to, to get people to lighten up, but also to socialize. Allow it. I think one thing that we really learned from this was having something so easy to learn it allowed one person to show someone else how to use it, which is really valuable as a way for people to, to talk to each other in the same space. So this is one we're particularly passionate about. How many people here have been to Silicon Valley? Wow. <laughs> okay, that's good. So we, were, we had a commission um, from the Zero One Arts Festival to think about doing an installation at City Hall in San Jose. And one of the things that people always say when they visit Silicon Valley is, they're like, where is it? Like, I'm, they'll call their friend in New York, they're like, I'm here and I can't find it. Um, <laughs> so, the, yay New York. But the, um, <laughs> the, one of the things I think is interesting about that is that Obviously, we know there's a lot of energy and people working and doing interesting things in Silicon Valley, but are we seeing it? Uh, so we decided to take the physical structure itself. It, it has a, a tall city hall and then this big open plaza, and it is this downtown surrounded by suburbs. So it has this huge open plaza with basically this empty 24 seven. 
we use the physical structure to project onto and then put a number put to, to project as a visualization tool and then put across the plaza a number of distinct input technologies to sensing sort of representational about types of ways in people interact with data streams in the city and ways that cities can listen to civically how they're being used. Um, and then in addition to that, we had a number of remote web-based input technologies. So within a five mile radius of City Hall, it would record if people were using uh, Flickr or Foursquare or Twitter about the event. So kind of, this will show it in, in showing all these different types of civic engagement and putting them on equal footing and allowing them to, or to be visualized, to show all of this activity, whether it's virtual or physical. So during the day, part of the, the idea was to drive people downtown, drive people to San Jose. So families would come up, play with the megaphone. They could shout and see animations move up the building. They could play hopscotch that was reactive. We hooked it up. Uh, we did our own sensing of the stoplights because they wouldn't give us the data. Um, and uh, hooked up the same thing with uh, the tables in the area. So we knew when people were eating lunch, kind of recording that data. But for me, which was great um, to activate the physical plaza. And then, but I have to say that personally, one of my favorite moments is that at kind of two or three in the morning, you, when no one's down on the physical plaza, the building still lit up with all this traffic from Twitter and Foursquare and Flickr. And it's just exciting to go, you know, if you're driving around, you could see this kind of beacon and realize like there are people up working right now. And there's a vibrancy in the community. And, and what's surprising, and to our, more to our, our point that it's, or, or to our point exactly, is that it's not an either or between where we live our, our lives and our social lives. But those started to work together. Because of the, the height of the building and because of the flatness, people who didn't go downtown started coming downtown. And they were driven by people who weren't downtown yet. They were actually driven by people being online activating the building, they want to go see what's down there, and then having that shared experience together when they're on the site. So that's sort of, I think the other thing, uh, or actually this is perfect, the next thing for us is our process itself is really driven around prototyping. Our process of understanding is about, um, actually it's kind of been a theme today about how important it is to build things to understand how they work, whether it's a, a model, um, or for us it's really about building physical interfaces that we can interact with ourselves that are in the, in the world and, and working. So in that last one, it was really exciting for us when thinking about the city of the future, our proposal of how to, how to think about it was to build it. Our proposal, even though it was sort of a playground sandbox version of it, it was up for two weeks. We really hoped that, by, that the people in Silicon Valley or in San Jose, engineers and, and, and researchers would see that and get inspired about what that, maybe it was terrible. I mean, I'm not saying it's terrible, but maybe there are parts of it that, there's obviously parts that could be improved and you can experience it to really find out what it was like. And so recently, over the last year, we've been really interested in data and how to let people feel data in space. Um, and so we're gonna show you some prototypes that we've been working on. So these are some, some peaks behind the curtain about our process right now. We've been working on how to create large interactive, uh, we, we're trying to do, I know we showed a lot of video-based work, we're trying to do more and more kinetic work. Um, there's a lot of risk involved in, in real estate in, in terms of building, or in, in physical world in terms of building kinetics because of the maintaining them. So we do a lot of our, this is a prototype of a uh, 60 foot long kinetic ribbon um, that we built all on a, in, in WebGL. WebGL. And one of the things that's exciting about that is using all browser-based technologies, we, ha we, we find engineers who can feed data into this. We create this visualization tool so they know what it's going to look like, and then we physicalize it. So, um, so then this is the other model we were building at the same time um, using a traditional architectural methodology of a sc scale model. And here, it, it gives you a totally different, even though it has a lot less points in it, um, seeing it in real life gives you a totally different feel about what it's going to be like um, and, and different view of the experience. And I think one of the things that's key to us is that we're, we're starting with really simple ways of doing this and trying to build up. How do you live in these kinds of environments over time? So this is another sketch for something we've been working on with these kinetic segments. And 
This one is particularly interesting to us because it can be repurposed for many different things. You can use it as a type of dynamic shelving um, where you can actually put stuff on it. And that's awesome. I know. That was a more appropriate reaction. Um. <laughs> and uh, um, I think that, uh, let's see the next one here. Yeah, so what we're doing now is trying to think about physicalizing data. You see this terrifying thing over on the, on the left there. It's some kind of, um, you know, look, looking at kind of the basics of kinetics and how we're going to be able to move things in the physical space. The, the video on the right we're excited about, it's the same as the last video, but shows another configuration of that room. So we're working on um, this as part of a project that's really thinking about giving spaces an API. Mm -hmm. So if you think about even this room, you know what, and in terms of how we can interact with it, we believe most of the technologies that built this room are actually um, very hard to get access to. Sometimes because it would be dangerous to, but often because of you know kind of proprietary technologies that don't like to play well with others. And par part of what we're doing is really trying to push that industry to learn more from what all of you have been doing mm -hmm. and from what the web has been doing to say, hey, you know what? You, if you open up some of these things, the people who use this space will be able to dynamically choreograph it in the way that they want. So they know that they can change the light levels based on this kind of condition or the temperature based on another type of condition. And what, what we're kind of um, looking at is we, we, we just did an open source project a few weeks ago called Space Brew, named after the homebrew computer club, not some other weirdness. But it's open source on GitHub. You can check it out. But the whole thing there is about being able to simply route the things in your environment to each other to, to create these dynamic interfaces. And yeah, so we really strongly believe that our, we're not going to invent some, a, a new technology. But if we can really make it easier to connect the technologies in the physical space, um, that, that new things emerge from putting them together. And it, it's really important for us in, in the, a lot of this work and, and the work that we've been doing is how do we make it easier and easier to use? Um, and you know, how do we make it so that someone else can, when we make one of these installations or make, some, or make something that's taking in all the sensing data about a space, how do we make that have a life continue beyond just that physical space that it's in or that initial instance of it? So. Great, thank you. Thanks.